one, again, thank you for uh, the privilege and opportunity to be a part uh, of the meetings here. It's always a real joy to see, quote, older faces. Russ Shepard, haven't seen this guy for years, and uh, still looks good and healthy, and uh, it's good to see some of the, quote, old timers. Always a real treat to meet new people as well. My topic this morning is titled, Two Programs, One Purpose. And the text passage is found here in Ephesians chapter 1. I'll begin reading at verse 8 and read on down to verse 10. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 8. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Let's pray. Our Father, we once again thank you for who you are as a loving God of grace and mercy and as a God of wisdom. And Father, as we come now with quiet hearts to learn about the mystery of your will, the mystery of the Father, may this information burn in our hearts just as it has burned in your heart. And Lord, may we rejoice in the magnitude of your wisdom and your glory. And may we rejoice knowing that our eternal destiny is sealed because of the achievements of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. We do, of course, pray these things now in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Ray Keeble just talked about uh, Jesus Christ being a dispensationalist, and he introduced the concept of dispensational uh, Bible study, dispensational, uh, dis dispensationalism. And, and as he mentioned, oftentimes it's viewed as a very uh, dirty word and a dangerous concept. And uh, we as Mid-Acts dispensationalists, our ears perk up when we read about mystery truth, obviously here in verse 9, we read something about the mystery of his will. In Paul's epistles, we find that word mystery 17 times. The next book that would use the word mystery uh, numerous times would be the book of Revelation. It uses the word only four times. My point being when we turn to the epistles of the Apostle Paul, we find the word mystery used on numerous occasions. And we, I hope, understand that when the Bible uses the word mystery, it isn't conveying the idea of information that is mysterious, that is, it's hard to grasp, it's difficult to comprehend, quite simply, the word mystery is used to convey the concept of information that was never known before. Information that God personally kept hidden away in his own heart. And when we look at the mystery in Paul's epistles, we find out that there isn't just one mystery that was revealed to the Apostle Paul. There are a number of different mysteries that God revealed to the Apostle Paul. There are a number of different aspects to the mystery that God reveals to the Apostle Paul. So, here in verse 9, we learn something very specific. We're not looking at the mystery in general. Look at verse 9 again. Having made known unto us... The mystery of what? His will. God personally is conveying to us today. God is personally revealing some extremely specific truth that concerns His will. You know what it's called in Colossians? Quickly turn to Colossians chapter 2. Here in Colossians chapter 2 verse 2, we learn about the mystery of the Father. Notice in Colossians 2.2 2, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of... How many mysteries are in this verse? 
There's three. So again, be careful. There are different types of mystery truth. What we're going to focus on this morning is here in verse 2. It's called the mystery of the Father. Go back to Ephesians chapter 1. Now, what is this mystery of the Father, or as Ephesians 1 verse 10 describes it, the mystery of His will? Well, in the context, we know what the mystery of His will is. Look there at verse 10. That in the dispensation of the fullness of what? Times. There is a final dispensation that God has already determined to carry out. Now, I want you in your mind's eye to envision, just, just in your mind's eye, uh, imagine a an horizontal line going from left to right, okay? And uh, just think of that line as heaven. And then below that, think of another line going from left to right. And that line labeled as earth. So just in your mind's eye, you have a horizontal line, heaven, and then you have a second line, earth. That line is a line that extends out into eternity. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 3. The mystery of God's will has to do with, notice in Ephesians 3 verse 11, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The mystery of the Father, the mystery of his will concerns an eternal purpose. We have these two horizontal lines and those two lines extend out forever and ever and ever and ever. But at the same time, go over to chapter 2. Notice verse 7. That in the age to come... Uh Uh-oh. Oh, come on. Wait, does it say in the age to come? Ah, the what? Plural. Well, obviously, what does that mean? Will there be more than one age in eternity? You know what God's trying to convey here? Listen, there are going to be two systems, two realms that will continue to function and operate for all of eternity. And on that grid, there will be successive what? Ages. We understand the concept of ages, don't we? In human history, we refer to the Bronze Age, right? We refer to the Uh, industrial age. We refer to what? The space age. So on that chart, we have two lines extending out into eternity, and we now have vertical lines that represent ages. By the way, verse 7, that in the ages, plural, to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us. Our involvement in God's eternal purpose forever and all of these succeeding ages. The dispensation of the fullness of times has everything to do with the purpose for which God created time specifically, go back to chapter 1, verse 10, specifically, In two realms, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in what? Heaven and which are on earth. And we're going to say some things about that in just a few minutes. Before we do so, let's just scan, let's go back up to verse 9 here. And, and, And notice, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. What what is God's good pleasure? And we need to recognize, you know, when we think about pleasure, go go to Revelation chapter 4. When we think about pleasure, we often think of recreational enjoyment, don't we? Most of us. We think about the 
entertainment value. When we think about pleasure, we think about amusement. Now, when God created, for example, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. So think about this. Pleasure. Did God decide, you know, I need some relief. You know, I need to kind of decompress a little bit. So for my own personal enjoyment and entertainment and, entertainment and recreation, I'm going to create heaven and earth. A couple of years ago, my son's home from college. He, you know, spends, he spent the summer with us. Uh, I remember walking into the house. As soon as I stepped through the door, I hear yelling. And my son is a gentle guy. You know, you don't, you know, Alex is not a guy who yells. But I'm hearing yelling, and all of a sudden, you know, there's some barking going. And I'm thinking, what's, what's going on? I, I go downstairs into our little family room, and, and here's my son, Alex. He's sitting on the floor with a headset on, and you know what's in his hand? A video control module or whatever that is. And, and you know, he's watching the big screen there, and he's communicating with his friends, and they're playing whatever, one of these battle games, you know. And Alex, he's, you know, he's screaming and, and barking out orders and so on. And, and, and he's playing a video game. God did not create heaven and earth in, as some form of video game. You know, when, when God says, I did it for my pleasure, there's a very specific connotation here. God does and can only ever do what is incomplete agreement with and consistent to his glory. All right? In other words, the good pleasure of God has to do with the expression of all that he is. We understand that pleasure does convey delight. And, and, and believe you me, God delighted. He rejoices in creating, but when God created heaven and earth, He did it for the express purpose of communicating something to His creature about who He is. God is a glorious God. In fact, that is what's happening in the book of Ephesians. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. And, uh, you know, you read through the book of Ephesians, and, and you know how often Paul keeps talking about glory? And glory? And glory, Ephesians chapter 3, look there at verse 21, Ephesians 3 verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all what? Ages. Wait, doesn't that sound, you understand what the dispensation of the fullness of times is all about? The great consummation of Almighty God, the purpose, the reason for creating heaven and earth, not for entertainment value, because He now has a vehicle, a literal object through which He can now make known, expose, reveal the essence of his character and his being when it comes to the glory of God, he desires the creature to benefit from it. He wants the creature to enjoy the glory. He wants his creature to participate in the glory that he is. That's the good pleasure of God. And there is a role that the Father has determined to place His Son in this whole grand majestic purpose, the eternal purpose. And you and I are a necessary component of that glory. Look there at verse 21, 21 again. Unto Him be glory in the, where? That's you, that's me, by Christ, Jesus, and this is important, throughout all ages, world what? Without it, you see the eternal concept, the eternal purpose. This is forever. This is without end for all of eternity. The good pleasure of God has everything to do with His purpose 
in making known His glory. If I were to ask you, who is the most God-centered being in the universe? What would the answer be? God. If I ask you, who loves God's glory more than any other person in the universe? You know what that answer is? God. And you think, wait a minute. That sounds rather egotistical and narcissistic, right? Wait, you understand that God's glory is the very foundation? It's the very base upon which he's able to be all that he needs to be for you. God is love, right? You know what allows God to be a God of love? His glory. His glory. And we're not going to go to Exodus chapter 31. Remember when Moses asked that question? Or he, he, asked, he makes the request, show me thy what? Glory. And God says, you want me to... You want me to put on a show? I'll showcase my glory. What did God do? He starts to rattle off the characteristics that are true of Almighty. The glory of God is the expression of His love, His grace, His mercy, forgiving. You see what? The glory of God. Understand, when we talk about the glory of God, the glory of God allows Him to love you. To love me. It's not, he's not some narcissist. He's not egotistical. Who he is enables him to do something for each and every one of us. And truly, when you begin to, dis, to, to, to examine and discover the glory of God, what God is doing, go back to Ephesians chapter 1, verse, verse 10. This is what God is excited about. In making known today the mystery of his will. Verse 9, according to his good pleasure, what God is doing is in perfect agreement with who he is. It is favorable to the glory, the essence, the person, the being. What makes God God? And the way God expresses it, he does it through what? Creation. Why did God create? He wants to relate. He wants to commune. He wants to fellowship. He wants to showcase the magnitude of the extreme lengths that he is willing to go. And that's what Paul's describing here. It's this mystery of Almighty God. And, and, and we see it all over the place. Just a couple more verses in that regard. Romans. Go to Romans chapter uh, 11, Romans chapter 11, uh, unmistakable, when you, when you read about the good pleasure, think about, nothing pleases God more than His glory, and, and you know where you and I should be excited, you and I can and should be excited about His glory, uh, Romans chapter 11, verse 36, for of Him and through Him, and to him are all things, notice, to whom be glory for how long? Wait a minute, when's forever? But in the dispensation of the fullness of what? Times. The, the very purpose. Forever. But do you see how glory is the hinge pinch? It's the hinge in all of this. It's the underpinning. Chapter 16, Romans chapter 16. Chapter 16, verse 27. To God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ. For how long? Here we go. For what? For ever. Going back to Ephesians chapter 1. You know, the mystery of God's will has everything to do with the Father's crowning achievement. You see, God is now placing His finishing final touch to His creative masterpiece. And He's making it known through the call and commission of the Apostle Paul, written down and preserved where? In Scripture, available to humanity right now on the pages of a book. Verse 9 having made known unto us the mystery of His will 
according to his good plan, consistent with what he is doing as a God of glory. A God who wants to showcase that glory. A God who invites his creature to be a part of that glory program. Look there in chapter 1, verse, uh, verse 5. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory. See, the glory of his grace. Verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his, what, glory. Verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of what? Glory. Verse 18, the end of the verse, and what the riches of the glory. You know what it is? Glory, glory, glory. God kept a secret that has everything to do with the revelation of glory. Now go back to chapter 1, verse 10. Uh, let's keep picking this up now. Uh, so, so we understand something about what ultimately pleases the Father. Oh, you know what? Go to Colossians chapter 1, because uh, Colossians 1, verse 19, actually provides a description of the thing that pleases the Father. Colossians chapter 1. Notice there in verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, should all fullness dwell. Now in the context, as we're going to find out here in just a moment, you know what the, uh, the, the fullness that this verse is talking about? In the context, it has to do with some things that were created in heaven and in earth. And what God has determined to do is to fully contain, fully contain all of the things that are in heaven and all the things that are in earth in one central singular rule. And that's his son. Look there at verse 18, the end of verse 18, that in all things he might have the what? God kept a secret. The Father kept a secret. The secret that the Father kept has to do with the ultimate expression of the immense magnitude of His glory vested in the person of His Son. The Father says, My Son will be declared worthy of being preeminent. You know, that word preeminent, interesting word, Latin, pre, before. Eminent, or not eminent, but eminence, eminere. That means to stand out. Think about that for a second. The Father's secret is my Son will one day before all things, He's going to stand out. The concept is He's supreme. The Lord Jesus, He is before all things, isn't He? Look there at verse 16. For by Him were all things created, right? Verse 17, and he is before all things. He's the first cause. But you know what verse 19 is describing? He's the ultimate end. He's the ultimate end. So this is what the Father wants to convey. Before all things, he's going to stand out. Question, during the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, did he stand out? I mean, there, there, was, a lot of, there was a lot of controversy over him. What, who is this guy? Did he stand out? I mean, you, you know, the Roman government dismissed him. What did religion do? Religion said, listen, his dad's a carpenter. His mother's jumping around. And, you know, and, and, and even the Lord asked the question, whom do men say what? That I am. In his humanity, the Lord did not stand out. You know what the Father's declaring? One day, there's going to be an installation service. And my son is going to be pre before all things. He is going to stand out all right. He will be declared the supreme, omnipotent ruler of all creation. Now, wait. Look there at verse 16. 
For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and what? Wait a minute. If I create an empire, don't I have the right to, to declare myself an emperor? Now think about that. Wait a minute. If Jesus created all things and he created it for himself, well then wait a minute. Well, of course he should be declared preeminent. Certainly he should be declared the emperor, the supreme omnipotent one. But wait a minute. That's not what's happening here. There's something that God wants to communicate regarding how it is his son is worthy to be preeminent. Yes, the Lord Jesus, he did create all things. And the all things, very specific context, right? What are the all things? Verse 16, all things created that are in what? Heaven and that are in earth. And what are these things? Visible and invisible. Now notice real carefully, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. So in the context, when we start learning about things in heaven and the things on the earth, he's not talking about the planetary systems. He's not talking about the, the stars. He's not talking about mountains and rivers and hills. The things in heaven concern a specific structure of governmental of rule and reign. There is governmental activity out there. Well, so too on the earth. The things on earth also concern governmental structures, governmental activities, as we, we read, principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, mights. What the Father intends to do in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He is going to gather together all things that are in heaven and that are on earth, these governmental structures, systems, these levels, principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, and so forth. All is going to be brought together in mutual consolidation under the rightful headship, the reign and the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. But wait, he already created it all for himself. Why is it such a big deal now for him to be declared the preeminent one? Well, we need to understand something. When, when we look at the things that are in heaven and that are on earth, Brother Ray already mentioned this. Clearly, what verse comes to mind? Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created what? The heaven and the earth. And from that point on, the Bible is a written record of the going on, the going on in heaven, in earth, because all that's occurring in the scriptures concern heaven and earth. We don't need to turn there. You know what happens in Revelation chapter 21? John, he looks up and he sees a new heaven and a new what? Earth. That entire Bible concerns itself with these two very specific realms. And these two realms have two very clear specific purposes and programs. And what we find through the pen of the Apostle Paul is the joy that God the Father is going to have when he sees his son take supreme control of both of those realms for all of eternity. Okay? Now, we do want to say some things about these two specific realms. 
When we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth, the greatest division in Scripture, let, let's turn there. Go to Genesis chapter 1. The greatest division is here in Genesis 1 verse 1. Here in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, we have a great division that is made in the beginning. God created the heaven and the what? Earth. Uh, what's the big deal? Go to chapter 14. Genesis chapter 14. In fact, Genesis chapter 14, and then go to Isaiah chapter 14, all right? And I know during the course of the week, there will be some other sections that are going to provide some more of the detail. Uh, let's just read it and uh, notice in Genesis chapter 14, verse 19. Genesis chapter 14, verse 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of uh, what? Heaven and earth. What's the big deal? Heaven and earth. Heaven and earth. Two distinct realms. By the way, the distinction between heaven and earth will always forever be retained. When Ephesians 1 verse 10 says that God the Father is going to gather together in what? Not as one. The verse doesn't say God's going to make as one all things in heaven. Rather, he's going to gather together all things in heaven, all things on earth. He's going to gather it together in one. But the unique, distinct characteristics and qualities of both of those realms will always be maintained. How do we know that? Revelation chapter 21, a new what? Heaven and a new what? Well, listen, if they're one and the same, why have a separation between the two? Heaven and earth, here, verse 19, uh, this, this title, Most High God, Possessor of what? Heaven and earth. Drop down to verse 22, And Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I, lift, I have lift mine hand up unto the Lord. Notice the Most High God, the Possessor of what? Listen, th there's something about heaven and earth. There are these power structures. And the reason we need to identify these power structures is because of a rebellion that was launched. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. And uh, there was a rebellion initiated by one of God's creatures. And again, I know, I think Alan Reagan, he's going to provide details, all right? There was a creature, some of all beauty, some of wisdom, and so forth, who challenged God. And by the way, Ezekiel 28 says that this creature launched a violent military campaign against God. God says, you know what? It's in the, the violence which is in thine heart. You've sinned. Violence. And, and that's going to be a key in understanding why God says, my son's the one who's worthy to take up rule and reign. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most what high. And we understand by reading Genesis chapter 14, what does it mean to be the most high God? That means you're possessor of what? Well, here is a direct challenge by Lucifer who in his heart convinced himself that he is worthy of possessing that title most high. And if you're most high, by default, what does that mean? You possess what? Heaven and earth. The Bible will chronicle the activities and the events and the prophecies and the predictions and the strategies. The Bible is a battle plan. It's God's response to this campaign of rebellion launched by Lucifer. So in Genesis 1-1, 1 
In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Verse 2, and the earth. The first program we need to recognize is God's purpose in reclaiming rightful authority where? On the earth. Now, quickly, go to uh, Exodus chapter 19. This first program is the subject of prophecy. In Exodus chapter 19, we have, in, in just a few verses, we have a description of God's purpose on the earth. And in this earthly program, there, there is a particular place, there is a clear program, there is a clear purpose, and there's a, a people. Those are four, just four simple characteristics. W whether it's heaven or earth, place, program, purpose, and people. Notice in, in, in Exodus chapter 19. In Exodus chapter 19, of course, uh, the Lord's reminding Israel of this great deliverance. And look there at verse 3. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of who? Israel. So we have a people identified, right? A very specific people. Who are they? Israel. This takes you back to Genesis, the Abrahamic covenant. You know what God told Abraham? He said, Abraham, I am going to make out of you a great nation. And in your seed. Well, who, who is this great nation that God personally created? Israel. Verse 4, ye have seen what I did unto the Egyptians, and I bear you up on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant. Now, wait a minute. There's the program. It's called the Mosaic Covenant. Galatians says that this particular covenant was added because of transgression. It's called the law. You have this nation, this people group called Israel, and God says, if you obey, that's the law. If you obey, good things will happen. If you don't obey, bad things will happen. So we have this Mosaic covenant, the law. He says, verse 5, now therefore, if you will obey my voice indeed and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people for all the, what? Earth. So what place is God focusing in on? The earth. The whole purpose for the creation of the nation of Israel is to accomplish something where? On the earth. Verse 6, why? And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. And holy nation, these are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children. You know what the purpose is? God deliberately creates a people group called Israel, and he tells Israel, I'm going to give you a program. It's called the law. It's the if-then Mosaic covenant. And with that program called the law, you are going to be resident upon the earth, and on that earth, you, Israel, will be a kingdom. Well, that's the whole objective. A kingdom on the earth vested in what people? Israel. So let's now fast forward all the way to the book of Matthew, okay? Go to the book of Matthew. And, and again, the subject, this is the very subject of prophecy. The prophetic scriptures, Genesis all the way through Malachi, spilling into Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. During the earthly ministry of Jesus Christ, we now have fulfillment of the prophecies that were already available to the nation of Israel. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 15 that the Lord Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Who are the circumcision in Scripture? Israel. And what's so special about Israel? They were the ones to whom God gave the covenants and the services and the law and the adoption and so on. So now in the book of Matthew, we find 
For example, in chapter 10, did I, did I tell you to go to Matthew chapter 10? Matthew chapter 10. Look here in Matthew chapter 10. And, and notice what the Lord Jesus Christ is preoccupied with during the course of his three, three and a half year ministry. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent forth and commanded them saying, go not into the way of the who? Because I hate Gentiles. No. What is that program already taught in prophecy? What, what is it that God told Abraham? In your seed, Abraham, shall all the families of the earth be what? blessed. So the Lord Jesus Christ, he affirms that covenant. He recognizes it, obviously, and he directly instructs his disciples, don't you go to the Gentiles and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, verse 6, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of who? Is, so here's that same group of people, right? Who's that people? Israel. Does Israel include Gentiles? Are Gentiles excluded? Hey, doesn't Paul tell us in Ephesians chapter 2, don't forget this, that you at one time in the past, in time past, ye were called uncircumcision by them which are called circumcision, made by the circumcision. And you know what? At that time, you Gentiles, you were outside. You were aliens. You were strangers. You were without God. You were without Jesus Christ. You are and were with out hope. And so if Jesus Christ now, he's concentrating on that specific people group. Well, what about that particular group of people? Verse 7, and as you go preach, saying what? The kingdom of heaven is what? It's at hand. Go to chapter 5, Matthew chapter 5. Okay, wait a minute. We, we read in Exodus, that a, a particular people, Israel, a particular purpose, what is it? A, a kingdom, here in Matthew chapter 5, uh, is it possible that that same program that God instituted in the book of Exodus is still operating when the Lord Jesus Christ is ministering? Well, look, Matthew chapter 5, notice there verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law, or the prophets, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Is that particular covenant program still in operation? Did, did the Lord Jesus say, hey, you know, Israel, you're no longer under the law? You know what the Lord Jesus is saying here? I'm still dealing with that same prophetic group of people, Israel. Don't you go to those Gentiles. They're not part of what God intended to do at that time. And, and you know what? It, it, this long-awaited kingdom is the object of our message. The kingdom of heaven. The days of heaven. Thy kingdom come where? On earth as it is in heaven. So when we examine the ministry of Jesus Christ... Israel's still the focus. The kingdom is still the goal. And, and certainly having it established on the earth. And you still have the law operating. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Well, after the cross, we discover things still have not changed. In Acts chapter 1, after the Lord Jesus spends time opening the scriptures. You know... Lord Jesus, kind of interesting. You know what he kept saying? Go, go to Luke. Go to Luke before you get there to Acts. Go to Luke chapter 24. In Luke chapter 24, look at what the Lord Jesus Christ says in Luke chapter 24. And notice in verse 27, Luke chapter four, uh, 24, Luke 24 verse 27. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them, in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Question, are you able to go to the prophets? Are you able to go to Moses and discover some things about Jesus? Isn't that what he just said? Drop down to verse 44. Look there at verse 44. 
And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are, were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning who? So was it possible for the nation of Israel to study the Old quote Old Testament scriptures, and learn about the coming Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what Jesus said to his, uh, to his enemies? He said, search the scriptures, they speak of who? Me. You know what Paul talks about? He talks about the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. Is there a difference between searching scripture to identify who this man Jesus Christ is and... Uh, not having any available scriptures. You see, Paul's message was unsearchable. You know why it was unsearchable? It was never revealed. But it did exist. You know, in the beginning God created the heaven and earth. You know that that is always used as a reference point? The Bible talks about things that were spoken since the world began. And then some things, and then something that was secret since the world began. And then Paul talks about things that God already determined to do before the world began. You see, Genesis 1 1, it's the key. It's the key. Well, anyway, Acts chapter 1, real quick. Acts chapter 1, verse 6, uh, verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the, uh, the kingdom? That's the goal of prophecy. And, and, and who, who, who is the people group? Well, Israel. Drop down to verse 8 at the very end of the verse. To the uttermost part of the what? The, the earth. And don't go there. Acts chapter 10. The law is still. Here's my point. The Old Testament, quote, Genesis. Israel, a kingdom on the earth. The law program. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. A kingdom on the earth through Israel, the law program, early acts, the kingdom on the earth through who? Israel. You know how many times Peter said Israel, Israel, you first, you for Israel, Israel, Israel. And when God finally said, hey, Peter, I want you to visit Cornelius. You know what Peter does? Peter actually, he quotes Leviticus chapter 20. And he says, Lord, you know, in effect, you already told us that those Gentiles are unclean. And I've never, ever eaten anything unclean. The reason God established those dietary laws, remember when God says there are certain foods that are clean, certain foods that are unclean? And then God says to Israel, you know why I did that? Because there are certain nations that are unclean. Which nations were unclean in the sight of God? All of them. Which nation was clean in the sight of God? Israel and Israel alone. That's why God established that dietary law. So anyway, Acts chapter 10, God says, I want you to go to Cornelius. And and, and Peter says, no, no. And then finally the Lord says, you're going to go. Compare that real quickly. Let's just go to Ephesians. Go to Ephesians. And on your way there, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. Well, wait a minute. Paul... His apostleship, which is clearly a global, international gospel, Paul's apostleship, his ministry, is a complete deviation. It's a radical 180 degree about face. You know that any honest student of Scripture will conclude that the content found in Paul's epistles is completely different than the content in the Old Testament, and the content found, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and early Acts. It's completely different. Because all of a sudden you have this guy who used to be a Pharisee. What does he say there in Romans chapter 11? Verse 11, now I say, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Who's he talking about? Israel, God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto who? The Gentiles. Oh man, is Israel the issue now? All of a sudden, now go to Ephesians chapter 3. You know, through the revelation committed to the Apostle Paul, we find out that God had a secret purpose. And the secret purpose that now is knowable as 
it was revealed to and through the Apostle Paul, concerns God dealing with the Gentiles, the ones that were dirty and unclean and excluded. And on the wrong side of that middle wall of partition, God's declaration is that, that God is now doing something with those Gentiles. Gen uh, Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for who? You Gentiles. And, and what place is God concentrating on? when he reveals this glorious truth to the Apostle Paul. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all, heavenly, uh, all spiritual blessings. Where? In heavenly places. Over and over again. Heavenly places. Heavenly places. Heavenly places. And you know what the purpose is? According to this revelation, go to Ephesians 2, verse 15. First of all, having abolished in, the, in his flesh the enmity, even the law. Is the law program a valid operating system today? According to that verse, what did God do to the law? You know what it means to abolish? It's gone. You are not under law. You are under grace. Well, wait a minute. God's shifted his focus to the Gentiles. He never did that before. God's concentrating on the heavenly places. The entire Old Testament, the entire gospel period concerns itself with what? The earth. The earth. God is saying that the law is a Abolished? Well, if the law is abolished, then what is in operation today? It's called the dispensation of the, look there at chapter 3, verse 2 again, if you have heard of the dispensation of the what? Grace of God. And you know what God's doing today? Verse 15 of chapter 2, Ephesians 2, verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances for the making of himself of twain one new what? A new man. It's a new creature. It's a new agency. It's a new entity. It's called the church, the body of Christ. We need to recognize these two specific realms and the clear distinctions that they possess because these two realms concern what God is doing in all the universe and what he intends to do forevermore. Now, in closing, go to Philippians chapter 2. All right. So the mystery of the Father's will is to install His Son as the supreme head of all of those governmental systems. That the will of the Father is to declare His Son the one who is worthy to exercise supremacy over all these things. And you ask, if He already created it for Himself, What's the big deal? Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. You know what Lucifer did? Lucifer's desire was to be like the Most High. And Ezekiel 28 says that he launched a campaign of violence. Satan used raw power, sheer force, launching a military campaign to secure the right to exercise his policy of supremacy where? In heaven and in earth. Satan never factored. He was, it was, Satan is incapable of calculating and of factoring in a particular characteristic and quality that God possesses. Something about the glory of God. And you know what that was? Verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Verse 7, but made himself of what? Jesus does not earn the right to be the potentate, to be preeminent to be the supreme emperor because he, through power and force and violence or the exercise of sovereign right. You know how the Lord Jesus earns the right to reign and rule? He made himself no reputation. He took upon him the form of a servant. He was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man. He what? Universal domination does not come by way or on the path of power. It comes 
by the way of apparent defeat, foolishness, weakness, what appeared to be a colossal catastrophic failure on the part of God. God calls it the foolishness of God. He calls it the weakness of God. You know what the Lord Jesus Christ did? He, through, through obedience, fear of death, he, he, being found in fashion as a man, humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. Now, look at verse 9. Wherefore, God also hath highly exalted him. Christ created it all. Lucifer took it all. And God says, well, I'm going to demonstrate the extreme magnitude of my glory. I'll become one of you. And I'll taste death for all of you. Satan, if he would have known about this particular quality, he would not have crucified the Lord of what? Glory. Now, here's the declaration. The, there's going to be an installation service in the future. And man, this is an installation service. Verse 9, Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of who? The one who was scorned and, re- and mocked and spat upon. Jesus, that's the name of his hum- humanity. You know what the Father is saying? The one who became a man the one who was hated, the one who was rejected, the one who in weakness and in foolishness, the Father says, at that name, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. God kept that secret burning within himself and is he excited to let all humanity know about it? Father, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your wisdom. We thank you that you have made known your mystery. And Father, may we just be motivated knowing that one day our Savior will rule in in supremacy over all the things that are there in the heavens and the earth. We thank you for in Christ's name.